so dwelling on the word, we go to Tabernacle of Praise. The Bible is an integral part of our development and our teaching. Um, we are Bible students, essentially. So um, no need to have a Bible study to the Bible studiers, but um, let's just start very conceptual. Um, so what, what does the word dwelling mean to, to all of you? Stay focused. Okay, focus is a good word. Dwelling is living the word. Okay. Living the word. Um, understanding the word. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Okay. So dwelling. Um, yeah, all of those answers are right. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> dwelling is a very deep word that, that can stretch over a lot of things. And it covers just that intense, deep. Um, usually the word dwelling refers to your home. This is where you are majority of the time, where you spend your, your quality time, maybe where you relax, where you rest, where you, um, where you are who you are, where you're, you know, like your family gets to see you for who you are, not necessarily when you're out in the store or you're at work and you have to put on, um, hopefully we're not putting on too many masks or, but you don't get to be a full expression of who you are, but at home, you're dwelling there. You don't dwell at work. You dwell at home where you can just, I just, the visual I have is almost like you sit in the chair and just let everything fall down and just, ah, now I'm dwelling. Um, and so what um, the word is also a very deep word, not to miss overuse the words, um, but what is word to you guys now as well? Well, that's a deep one. Um, <laughs> what came what came to my mind is is meat. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, it's food. Word. I I'm looking at it in the biblical sense, though. Yeah. The word is what God speaks. It's his his word to us is speaking to us mm -hmm. and jesus is the living word <laughs> became flesh and dwelt among us <laughs> exactly yeah which is meat everything he gives we live not by bread alone but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of god it's, it's that's how we live it's our sustenance i was gonna say truth the word is truth Mm. that is so good especially in this day and age <laughs> that's my number one platform is running around trying to <laughs> tell people stop you don't have a truth <laughs> you have an opinion <laughs> truth is only one direction it's parallel with everything else um yeah anybody else what is the word when you hear the word what does that mean to you or what what comes to mind The Bible comes to mind when you say the words. <laughs> exactly. So this is also a word that's very um, multi-dimensional, multi-linear. Um, so dwelling on the word and just getting the, uh, the syllabus on what we're teaching. It just, at first I wanted to like sit with it on all of you and just see what it meant you know what does it mean to us because it all means something different what, to dwell on the word um and then looking even deeper into the word there are a lot of connections into the word the way we just use the word word um and so this is a bible study this is going to be very heavily dependent on the the bible 
Um, but um, in the Bible, when it talks about the word, the Greek word is logos. And we've all heard this, um, where um, logos basically identifies the expression of a thought. And so that's the definition of logos. This is, you know, you have a thought, now you put it to word and word it almost manifests the thought into a reality. And um, like, if you say something, what is the spirit of that word? What is the life that's given to that word? You have words that are written on paper, but there's no life to them. But then when you put them in motion or you, you assign meaning to them, that's the life in that word. Um, so we use it every day in language, but there's a slight distinction. And um, so I'm going to have somebody read um, John 1, 1 through 18. It's a long passage. Um, so if you want to divide it up, you can. Um, but yeah, 1 through 18, just to kind of lay the groundwork. Okay, I'm going to read it. Uh, John 1, 1 through 13. In the beginning, oh, was, oh sorry. That's okay. What? 18, keep going. <laughs> John 1 through 18. Okay. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And He was in the beginning with God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Christ, Jesus Christ, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, that was a lot. And there's a lot in there. Um, so the word described in John is Jesus, right? Um, this is a scripture that we always point to, just pointing out, hey, Jesus has been from the beginning since always. He is who everything has been about. It's almost that reveal of the whole purpose of the Bible. Jesus is the one that's always been there. He's the one who created everything. Um, and so even to the point of, it's amazing that, um, and I think Debbie, uh, Pastor Deborah preached on this a while back about the light in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And then God said, let there be light. And that distinction, I've always noticed the distinction because God created light, you know, right away. But it was, I think, at the fourth day when he created the sun and the moon. And so what's the light that he created first? The light is that creation, the light of illumination, of life, of, you know, that let there be light let that light, Jesus is that light. And Jesus is the one who everything was created through. And so 
when we talk about the logos, the logos is the expression of a thought, right? And that's what we said already. That's the definition of logos. And so God always had been, never have a beginning, never has an end. So the thought of God became the logos, became Christ. God's intention, God's purpose had a human component to it and became a man and dwelled with us. That's the word in its simplistic form, <laughs> as, as basic as we can get it. Jesus is the thought of God. God had a plan and that plan was Jesus. Well, what are you going to do about the, get, uh, Jesus? Uh, what, what about this? You're going to create men, Jesus. Um, how, how is this Jesus? God's thought, God's everything revolves around Jesus. Jesus is the word. Um, now, um, like I forgot who said last, but you know, when you think of the word, you think of the Bible. Um, very, very true. So we have the Bible. And the connection there is that you think of the Bible as um, the recorded documentation of Jesus. <laughs> so Jesus was the, is the word, was there from the beginning, from before the beginning. He is the, um, the thought manifested of God. But then now we have a re record of that, which we call the Bible. Um, and that is probably as close as I can connect them because it is such a profound piece that I don't even feel honor worthy to teach or to share because you guys are all much more versed than I am. Um, and so, so the thought of God became human, dwelled with us, and the Bible is the recording of that dwelling with us that has been left with us for all time. It's the written word if that um, makes it even better. It's the inspired word of God. And so what does that mean to you guys when I say the inspired word of God? Now we're talking about specifically the Bible. Life. Inspired life. Hope, <laughs> it inspires, it, yeah, it's deep, <laughs> it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's rich, it's. The, I, the inspired word of God was, well, the, the written down Bible, the Holy Spirit, God, the Spirit of God inspired men to write it. Mm -hmm. And there's, I can't, I, I have to give you the scripture for that to back that up, but every word was written, was inspired by the, by the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So it came straight from God through the hand of man in their own personality, showing their own personality. I, when I, thank you, Kareen, because when I think of inspired, I think of like, God is the driving force behind it. He is the power. He is the motivation. It's it just it all comes from him, like Kareem said, spoken through or written down mm -hmm. uh, by another person. So when I think of inspired, you know, I think that is like the thing that fuels me, the thing that drives me, the thing that energizes me, the thing that powers me. You know, yeah. I, I that word is a very um, deep word I guess <laughs> yeah um it is a deep word and I think it's in um it's important to have a conversation about it because this can create so many different avenues and how people think about the bible as well um and so I rarely do this but I'm I'm going to read the definition of inspired um it's an adjective um, and the first definition is of extraordinary quality, as if arising from some external creative, 
And then the example is they had to thank the goalie for some inspired saves. Um, and then number two, of air or another substance that is breathed in. Inspired air must be humidified. Um, so I like the second definition because it talks about, you know, you think of the Bible, God's breath breathing in the word. Um, and essentially, and to me, because this is a Bible study, this is a discussion. Um, and so we all kind of come from different backgrounds and we all, we know God differently. Each one of us, that's the amazing thing of God is that he's personal to each one of us. Um, my version of inspired word of God is that um, God didn't necessarily give everybody word for word exactly what to write down, but gave them um, what to write down, how to, the spirit of the word, the, what he wanted to say. Um, and I think a lot of it, you know, it's like modern day prophecy or old prophecy. And I'm not a prophet, but from what I understand, um, God gives you a prophecy for someone or a word for someone. And it's your personality, like uh, Sister Kareen said, your personality that gives it out. You're giving the, the nuts and bolts and the, everything that he wants you to cover in that. But maybe you add some personality to it. You add flair or you add your own spin on how you interpret it that they might understand it. Um, and so God's giving this word and saying, hey, I have something for you to write. I have something for you to, you know, I'm going to give this to you. I need you to write it down. And so you have a little bit of variance in there, which is also what makes the Bible so amazing, which we'll get into later, um, because God does give that freedom to all the authors to kind of write in their own way. Yet, when they do, you're still getting the essence of what's written that connects right back to God, because you see that, that connection. Um, please let somebody else uh, let me know if I am on, off, or how, how that resonates with you. It, it makes it, I'm not uh, good with explaining stuff, but what you're saying, uh, it it makes sense to me because um, it's like, like you said, someone uh, want to say something to someone and, and uh, be able to say it in love and, you know, and add, you know, have the word of God in it and and God, uh, what I'm saying is God will, um, he gives me what to say sometimes to someone. And um, I feel like that's, that's, that's part of uh, this word expiring. You know, I didn't know that, but listening to what you were, some of the things you were saying, Brian, it 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 just it kind of makes sense to me, you know, because you know that's how how kind of I look at it, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and I'm I feel like we're turning into this. I didn't even anticipate spending this much time on the inspired word of God, um, but this day and age, I think it's very important, especially for our path of discipleship, because there are so many denominations, there's so many walks with God out there. And there's so many different interpretations of the Bible, where you have groups of people that um, take the word in their translation. And literally, every single word that's in there, that's all how they see it. They're not looking at the spirit of God. They're not looking at what did God intend for this? They're not putting it in context with that society that maybe it was written in. Um, they're only taking the actual letters of the words and applying it to their life and more importantly to everybody else's life where they're looking at the Bible essentially as they're using the Bible as binoculars rather than a mirror to look at their own lives. And so... Um, so to think of that word inspired, and there's a lot of, and we're only going to hear more and more of it. I know you guys probably hear it also, just the 
in which we're going to get into a lot of the criticism of the word is that, oh, there's inconsistencies. You have other, like Muslims will always point out word inconsistencies or this or that or mistakes that they find. But we know that the Bible is inher inerrant because it's the perfect word of God. However, in the Bible, in the pages, there may be typos, there may be mistakes or, you know, misalignments with certain things because scribes copied down by hand, the human beings, you know. So to draw that distinction that God's inspired word, um, which will break this down even more, um, that's how much God loves us is to allow that freedom to just speak to us and let us tell the story that he's giving us, not necessarily uh, we talked last week about uh, discipline and not that abusive force of power. You have to say these exact words or else, you know, I'm going to pour my wrath out on you. You know, it's God gave us word to write down and people wrote it down. And so we'll see, we'll dig in a little deeper about how that came to be. Um, and so we just want to spend time building up you know, the Bible, dwelling on the word. What is this word? What is the book? What is the Bible that we live by, that we've had all of our lives? Um, and hopefully throughout all this, um, you guys may learn something new and um, interesting and just kind of unpack that a little more. Um, so a little bit about the Bible, just some stats here. Um, the Bible consists of 66 books. 66 different books. Um, there are 39 books in the Old Testament. There's 27 books in the New Testament. This is our Bible. Um, there are other versions of the Bible, like the, the Catholics have a different canon that has some more books. Um, and there are lots of other books out there that aren't canonized as well, which we'll talk about as well. Um, but our version of the Bible um, which was established about 400 or so AD, um, has 39 Old Testament books, 27 new. And there are about 40 different authors, most of them known. Some of them are still unknown. So books were written, but they don't have the exact accredited author. Um, and these books were written between about 1450 or so BC and about 100 years after Christ. So that frame of time um, covers about 1,500 years. All these different 66 books were written over 1,500 years. That in itself is impressive. Um, they were written on three different continents, written in three different languages, compiled together. Um, this is the oldest book still circulating with the most sold copies in history ever is the Bible. So it's a pretty big deal. Wait, um, Brendan, excuse me, can you just clarify when you say, are you talking about originally written in three different continents and three different languages? Are you talking about the original yes. writing? Okay, thank you. Yeah, the original writings, the people that put pen to papyrus or whatever me mediums they had. Um, yeah, that took place on three different continents, essentially Africa, Asia, and um, Europe. So um and Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic are the three languages. Um, and so this book, obviously, since it's top, top notch, it's going to receive the most criticism um, ever, which it is. It's the, the most contested book um, that has ever uh, existed. And um, and so it's constantly having to prove itself, which it does. And it stands up to all the criticism um, so much that there's so much proof that if there's really a problem, it's really a problem with us. And a problem, it's safe to say it's a problem with our interpretation and understanding of it. And so um, some of these criticisms that I hear personally, and you guys may have other criticisms that you hear as well, um, it's full of contradictions and discrepancies, okay? People, a lot of people will say that out there. Um, a lot of people have problems with how much violence is in it and that it was used to justify more murders, atrocities like the Crusades or 
you know, somebody posted something on Facebook not too long ago. It was a quote that said, um, evil has never been displayed um, more genuinely and more happily than when it done for a religious reason or something like that. But all I had to say to that was, well, what about Hitler? What about Stalin? What about, you know, all these things? And actually there's data that says the Crusades didn't kill as many people as some of these other situations. Um, uh, people say it's an outdated ancient book that doesn't apply to today's world. It doesn't transfer or, or age well, as people say. Um, and then they say it's been changed many times and not trustworthy because it's such an old book, because it's been written in multiple languages, um, you can't consider it a source of trustworthiness or trace it back to original authors and, and whatnot. Um, so just kind of putting that out there, um, what would you guys say to some of these questions? How would you answer some of those? Maybe just as suffice as possible and succinct. And have you heard these criticisms? Or maybe some other criticisms as well that you've heard. I have heard criticisms. Um, and sadly, my brother was is one of the greatest criticizers. <laughs> and he was the one who was instrumental in, in bringing me to the Lord. And that's what was so <laughs> ironic about it. He he got saved during the Jesus movement back in the 60s. So he used to always witness to me and Charlene and tell us how much we need Jesus and all that. So we came to the Lord. In fact, I came to the Lord at his church. And um, since then, he's gone way off somewhere. But um, he, he's posted some horrible things on Facebook about the Bible um not it, it has all kinds of mistakes in it and all this like what you what you have written out here mm -hmm. and some other things and he's he, my brother's very well he was very well educated very intellectual and knows how to talk way more than i do so i don't want to waste my time trying to argue with him because i can't do it in the intellectual level that he does I just tell him truth. I don't even argue with him at all. But what I would say, if he says, Corrine, what do you think about this? Blah, blah, blah. I would say God's word is true. He said it's true. And everything else is a lie. And I, it's almost like God said, it, I believe it. So that's it. I mean, I, I, you can't make a person believe. You, you have to tell them what you know. And they and not waste your time arguing with them. That's what I say. I don't, I'm not a good debater. I'll say, well, I'm sorry you feel that way, but this is what this is truth. Mm -hmm. And then they'll always say that's true for you. Mm -hmm. You know, they always say, oh, it's true for you. No, truth is truth. So um, let's change the subject. That's what I say. <laughs> Just, I don't want to argue with them. <laughs> well, I don't waste yeah. my breath. A lot of things that I have found, and I watch a lot of videos, a lot of um, talks, almost like TED Talks or conferences and things like that. There's a lot of videos on YouTube, um, pastors, and um, not to overshadow on um, the apologetics session coming up later this year, but um, a lot of apologetics. And one thing that I've realize is that a lot of people just make up stuff they make up what they want to hear and they make up what they feel um you know 68 percent of statistics are made up <laughs> and so um you know this this is what people do and so they say whatever they want to say they say there's no evidence in this there's it's like well you know what you ask them a simple question where did you hear that what makes you think that you know challenge it a little bit and see if it comes down because truth is truth and just because they don't know it doesn't mean it's not true it just means they haven't realized it yet or understood it so um yeah and we'll go through some of these um criticisms anybody else
Yeah, I just always hear it's it's a, it was just written by man. Mm, yeah. Mm. Old trustworthy man bashing. <laughs> Men are no good. How can I trust this Bible? It was written by men who hated women, <laughs> who just wanted to push their way. <laughs> well, <laughs> not really. <laughs> Christianity wasn't even about pushing power. It was about eyewitness testimony. And honestly, they had, and here's one of the best parts about it is that the Bible relies on women as the sole testimony, which didn't even count back then. So if they did make up a a, a new religion and wanted to push it to everybody they wouldn't have used women to be the sole testimony of the the major events of it because they'd get thrown out they'd build up this huge case of all this stuff like and most of the disciples it was not favoring them all the the actions in the gospels usually when people lie and make up a story they're not telling the most embarrassing parts of themselves they're trying to make themselves look good and the gospels don't do anything about making somebody look good. So why would, why would somebody make that stuff up? You know, it has to be true because why would anybody do that? But this is not our, but, you know, dwelling on the word, we just want to make sure that the word that we have, the Bible that we have is trustworthy, is reliable, is something that we can dwell on and put our faith in and invest our lives into and know that we're going to get the reward out of that. Um, let's see here. Okay, so how is the Bible validated? You know what is going on? With, okay, there we go. Um, so how do we validate the Bible? And we're going to go back to some of those other things as well um, and kind of touch base on some of them. Um, so some of these things that I came up with, how the Bible is validated, fruit, you know, that's the most obvious one. The personal experience that we have when we apply what it says and live it out in our lives and watch the fruit that's done. Um, the archaeology, um, history, scientifically, and prophecy, obviously. That's the number one thing that can really stand out um, from any other religion, any other book. Um, you know, the Book of Mormon is coming to mind. Not to, we don't bash people, but it's just almost laughable how the Book of Mormon came to be, and um, even the character of Joseph Smith and all the the things that went on in his life. And just when you really look at the story of that, it's like, how can people be so deceived and fall for this and just walk? Because it's so close to the truth, but it's just enough off that, you know, it's just, it hurts. Um, but yes, so the Bible stands on its own. Um, like I said, the biggest proof that the Bible is true is when you apply the concepts into your life and watch the transformation happen. That's We all are here because of that, because we have witnessed Christ himself. God lives in us. Holy Spirit dwells in us and guides us. And we hear him and we feel him and, you know, all the senses. And um, But many religions have a written book that they claim the truth without much more to substantiate it. A lot of them use intimidation. A lot of them just use tradition. A lot of them will beat you and ostracize you if you question. I know um, in the Buddhist community, they're not allowed to question things. They'll be put out. And it, a lot of these religions seem very open until you start to question and try to figure things out and unravel. God says, taste and see. He wants us to look and to, you know, to look deeper don't just go with your heart. Don't investigate, find out what's going on. And then you see the, the fruit there. Um, but what does it say? God could work like that as well. But from the beginning, he gives evidence. God's, God's good enough to stand on his own, just, you know, stand on his word. But he's so loving that he gives us the evidence. He built it in to the word he built it into history he built it in throughout everything and hopefully you see some of that through these classes um and so the bible in itself is no different god's always backed up what he said and he's used it in multiple ways um so let's look at archaeology a little bit 
uh, archaeology definitely confirms the Bible. If you just Google, does archaeology confirm the Bible or is the Bible truth? Um, the first thing that comes up is archaeologists have confirmed unanimously that the Bible um, essentially is true. Archaeology does back it up. Um, there have been over dozens of thousands of digs at different locations, are probably about 30,000 of people investigating the, the things of the Bible, um, resulting in the evidence of what was written is verified. They found the artifacts of things that are there. Um, and I'm almost, you know, I love a good conspiracy theory. And I happen to think there are probably more that have just not been released to public because of what it would do to the people, like the kingdom of God. It would just blow us up to the front forefront. And there are a lot of people, this is the enemy's world. He doesn't want that to happen. So I think people have found more things that they're not telling, that they're keeping locked under key um, in a cave, in a dungeon, underneath some building somewhere, like major things um, that have yet to be revealed, even though they've probably been found by now. Um, but the fun thing about the archaeology is that this is an ongoing quest, only to further substantiate scripture. Like we've had enough stuff that has proven things that they've found, you know, uh, Pontius Pilate, uh, evidence of him that he existed, that, you know, even to the point that, you know, it's undisputable that Christ existed because of the archaeology, because of things they found in, in places. Um, they validate people, specific details about the stories, and the places that the Bible, um, that places the Bible within history, because history is something that's ongoing, and now archaeology has the ability to place the Bible in its place in history along each story. Um, you know, it's more than just a storybook. These people existed, these things happened, and we have backup for that. Scientists are backing it up regardless of what you may hear. Uh, history. History works hand in hand with archaeology, obviously, because history is the, the telling of the past. Archaeology is the evidence of the, the telling. Um, but we talked in other classes um, in discipleship about, you know, how we learn about the disciples using extracurricular sources, extra biblical sources that give us information about the people. Um, and so that validates the events that happen. That's how we know that Caesar Augustus lived. That's how we know that um, Socrates was a philosopher and lived in Greece. So people wrote down things, they talked about it, eyewitnesses, and the Bible shows that um, it's in alignment with the historical documents of the time. So you have extra biblical documents, like we talked about the writer Josephus in Rome in the first century. He wrote about a lot of the things that are in the Bible. He is not a biblical author, but he is an author. And he wrote about things that happened. So you can say, okay, he talked about this. Oh, and the Bible also talks about this. That sh probably happened. Um, so the information that's given in the Bible is accurate and reliable. Um, so much, like I said, that there's no question from historians at this point, regardless of how people may believe um, that Jesus Christ was a man he was crucified by Pontius Pilate in the first century. That's indisputable. People, they, there's enough evidence to actually back that up. Um, now, if he's the son of God and rose from the dead and what happened there, um, that's where the debate still lies, where people try to offer their own opinions. Um, but even through the eyewitness accounts, the testimony provide more than enough evidence that he was seen alive after he was dead. So there's a lot of evidence that points to Jesus rose from the dead. It's just that people may not want to accept it. Um, and the cool thing is that there's so much detail around each story in the Bible that you can pick any of those points and find its place in history and corroborate it with the other works, like I said. So the Bible does is a historical document. Um, and so that's the beautiful thing about the Bible. It's not a book of morals. It's not a to-do book, you know. 
it's a history book. It's a science book. It's a book of, you know, what not to do. People always want to point at the bad stories and say, oh, well, you know, God annihilated the, the Hittites. So we should go and kill people. It's like, well, God actually pointed out a lot of things that people shouldn't do <laughs> and said, here's what happens if you do that. I recommend you do this way. But if you didn't, now you have an example of what happened. You know, you have to really understand the Bible. Um, in a scientific way, um, I love that the biggest debate these days, which you've probably heard as well, is whether to trust the Bible or science. And the simple lie that they can't agree, that it's one or the other. You have to either believe that God created heavens and the earth and everything in six literal 24 hour days, or you have to believe that we were 4.6 billion years old and um, came from evolution from apes and stuff. It's like, those are the two most dynamic, far apart thoughts, but that they can't, you know, that we can't both be wrong. You know, that option is not there. Um, and God never rejected science. God gave us science. And the way that I see it, it's not one or the other. In fact, science is basically the natural explanation of what God puts in motion, what God has done. Science is our way of explaining that. Um, they discovered gravity, you know, God has already placed gravity in, you know, in effect, and we discover it. So now we can explain it. We have formulas, we have science and physics to talk about it. It's our way of understanding, oh, this is what, you know, and you have a lot of physicists and astrophysicists that talk about, well, back in the old days, they didn't understand science. So they just said, God did this. And now we understand why this happens in this. So you don't need that explanation anymore. It's like, well, you kind of do still need that explanation because yes, you have a mathematical equation that quantifies that. But at the end of the day, that mathematical equation actually just says, this is how God did what he did, but he still did it. So um, again, people just can't see it. And so um here's my favorite part is that there are supernatural things that God does that will never have an explanation. Science will never be able to quantify certain things because it's above the comprehension of the natural. Science depends on the natural, time, space, and matter. These are the three um, elements that we need to do science. It's observable, it's, it's touchable, it's um, it's timeable over time, you see things, but God is outside of those elements. And so he can do things that science will never be able to explain because you can't use science to explain things that are above natural. <laughs> That's, you need natural. That's why it's supernatural because it's above natural. <laughs> um, so there's so many things that God has established that the scientific community just hasn't caught up to for thousands of years they're just not at that level yet and so i just i love to sit back and watch science prove things that have already been in the bible for thousands of years and so when they're like oh we discovered this it's like no you didn't it's already it's been written there um so and in the fact it's so frustrating that when they do discover and then they neglect to see that it's been written down for the eons um but they want to take the credit for it but we know that, you know what, this is the way God has established it. And yes, we may learn more through science about how God has established, um, which is up for debate. It's good fun. You know, young earth, old earth creation. It's, you know, that debate will always go until we get to heaven. God hasn't given us a specific answer on how he's done it. But I happen to think it may be longer than, you know, six days. Mm -hmm. Who knows? he set a pattern on the earth and how things happen and things change and things take time and God has process. And if you look at our lives, things don't happen as instantly as that. So I happen to think he also let things evolve that way throughout the earth too, and just created and let the species develop and let us grow. And, you know, so anyway, um, so science is another way that um, the Bible 
is justified and validated. Um, so uh, astronomy, geology, um, Job talks about how the earth and the universe is held together with nothing. You know, these are just some references of how science is substantiating the word of God. Um, and Job is arguably the first book ever written, the oldest book um, before Genesis. Mm -hmm. and how the water cycle works or how the core of the earth is like fire you know yes he may have seen a volcano maybe I don't know um, but the way it's described he would have no way of knowing that they didn't have the scientific uh, technology to dig to the core of the earth and find samples of magma and, and things like that um, and the water cycle of you know the, not just that it rains, because obviously you can see rain, but how it is, the droplets, the invisible droplets, things like that that were described that God gave him that only God can give him. Um, things like washing hands and quarantine, you know, and blood being the life source. When God gave the laws in Leviticus, um, these are thousands of years before doctors discovered oh, we should wash our hands. It was like the 1800s that they understood pathology that if you wash your hands under running water, you won't transfer illnesses to patients and, and things like that. And you can actually clean yourself. God gave that to the Israelites when he mm -hmm. laid out the laws. The mm -hmm. procedures, they had to wash their hands under running water. <laughs> um, so things like that. Um, and then blood being the life source. I, I find it laughable that we, up until like the 50s, I think we were still doing um, bleeding, bloodletting, where people were just thinking, you're sick, I can't heal you, so let's just let you bleed until you're better. Mm -hmm. God said, you know, there's so many connections about the blood. That's why we have the atonement. That's why God used the blood, because that's where life is. So life has to be given. Um, and honestly, funny, fun story. Um, I just heard something this morning that I'd never connected. This is why I love the word. It just continually comes out with more and more stuff. Um, so tell me if you guys have already had this revelation, but I never really made the connection about the 10 plagues um, and the signs in Egypt, where um, the first one when God took Moses to tap the Nile River and it turned to blood. It's almost as if, because so many decades before the Egyptians were killing all the Hebrew babies and drowning them in the Nile, mm -hmm. that the blood of the babies were crying. It's almost like he was saying, I, I see everything. You drowned all my babies in the Nile. The Nile is now the blood of my babies. How mm -hmm. incredible is that? Wow. <laughs> it was like, I'm on the scene now things are going to be a little different now. You know, you, what you did in the dark is going to come to light. Everything is known that's hidden. Wow. But anyway, wow. that's not on my agenda, but just a side note. Yeah. Um, and that was the first thing he did. <laughs> He's like, you know what? There's going to be a bunch of plagues, but I'm going to need you to show him something. <laughs> Turn them now to blood. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, and then... So the specifications that God gave Noah's ark, right? Um, it's the perfect design for a ship. And Noah lived in the Bronze Age. He didn't have all this technology, right? He had to rely on the word of God to build that ship and the size of it. Um, and to the point that using those specifications, there's no modern design that they can create an engineer that can outperform Noah's ark. Like they've rebuilt replicas of it and it's actually the highest performing ship um, design there is noah wouldn't have come up with this on his own it was a drought <laughs> it didn't rain <laughs> ever um so and then you know dinosaurs are in job god talks about the leviathan and you know tails big as the cedar you know legs the size and you know just Every, there's a lot in Job where God just talks about geology, ast astronomy, and, and all the sciences, the universe, and how it's put together. Um, there's more examples. Um, God, you know, stretching out those heavens and 
you know, they just recently realized that the universe is constantly expanding and it's constantly being stretched out. And, you know, I read something else that how he says, can you loosen Orion's belt, which I've always thought was the coolest line ever in the Bible. That, that whole chapter is my favorite chapter where God just told Job, now come here and answer like a man. If you're going to be a man, let me ask you some questions. And he said, can you loosen Orion's belt? Well, Orion's belt, the stars are actually spreading out. They're, they're, they're going further and further apart. I didn't know this. I thought it as just a really witty way to say like Orion's wearing a belt. I could take off his belt if I want to. No, it's actually spreading apart and he's loosening the belt. Wow. So it's just incredible the more that we dwell on the word. And I love the Bible. I love the word of God. I love everything in there and I love the connections, which we'll see in a little bit too. Um, But yeah, just the poetry in there, just the symbolism, everything that's intertwined in there. So if we're just reading the Bible as words on a page, we're really doing ourselves a disservice um, without doing the extra study around it as well. There's a lot of reason I want to go to Israel because it's just going to jump out off the page to me and you'll see the things that um they're talking about have any of you ever been to israel i have um three times and it oh. just it's amazing if the bible just opens up to you and you realize how, the reality of god's word because mm-hmm. there the places are right there that mm-hmm. he spoke of and not, not necessarily what they call the traditional sites where Jesus was born or where he, he cried or what, you know, <laughs> different things like that. But, but I mean, to go over into to Moab, to, to Jordan, and then mm-hmm. you see where Abraham, they pointed the mountain where Abraham went and, and never came back. And, but, you know, seeing the Canaan land, going across to, to Jericho, and seeing the thick, thick, thick walls mm-hmm. and feeling the difference between Jordan and an Arabic Muslim place country stepping over into um, Jericho, you feel the presence of the Lord. You feel the difference in the spirit, mm-hmm. in, the, in, in the atmosphere. And um, yeah, I, I wish every single believer could go over to Israel. I, I wish so that they could see, they can walk the land, they can feel mm-hmm. his presence. I mean, we feel his presence here, but there it's just, it's just like, whoa. <laughs> yeah. It's mind boggling. It I really is. Imagine. Yeah. And to think that the entire Bible, those 1500 years were all written about, like when you see it on a map or even like the closest I've been is the Holy Land experience in Orlando the TBN built. <laughs> so um, they have a, a scale replica of the area. And it's like, there's only like, you know, I, maybe 20 miles or something. I don't know what the number is, but it's just such, such a short distance of all these places where all of this just took place. And it's yeah. incredible. And even, even on the, the, when they were on the, the boat, the fishermen were on the boats and, and the Lake Gennesaret, where you know they're talking about the storms and everything we went out on a boat and brother wood made us go to the on top of the boat and it was windy out there and i was begging him can we please go down below it's too windy up there we're gonna get blown over or <laughs> it's just, and he just got mad he's get up there so we had to get up to the top this is a sideline so we had to get up the top and i even have pictures of us holding on to our hair and wigs and everything keep from getting blown away because we had to sit on top of the boat during this windstorm <laughs> on the on the sea of galilee in Lake that's, <laughs> that's really funny yeah that's that's it's amazing because we you know and it's it just the scripture comes to mind blessed are those who um you know who who have seen and believe but even more so if those who haven't seen you know we haven't seen we haven't been there we didn't understand the culture the context he gave it to the people in everyday language he gave them cereal to feed them 
but we have to piece it all together but he's still illuminating and like it goes back to the first one the fruit we don't even understand the culture the language the context the times yet it still pertains to us and it still lives true to us um it's it's incredible i know we're running out of time here but we started a couple minutes late so i'll go a little bit over hopefully you guys can stay um but i have one more piece here um to talk about the prophecy of the bible right um and us being a prophetic church this is a very key point to us and how the bible validates itself um there's if we look at the bible as a whole there's about 2500 prophecies in the bible and over 2000 of them have come to pass and that's a very simple test um, of another religion's book look at how many prophecies they have in there and look how many of them have come true again i'm picking on the book of mormon but there are obvious areas where he's taken um the words of moses and added himself into the prophets uh into the prophecies and um changed things around so that it you know the points that he wanted to make and added on there and obviously these prophecies hadn't come true um and so if they make a prophecy in any other book and it doesn't come true you know it's false it's easy you know easy to determine um and of those 2000 prophecies that have been fulfilled over 300 of them were by jesus by himself and so obviously he's a pretty big deal in the bible a lot of prophecies about jesus um and that's one of the biggest pieces of evidence that we have that shows he is who he said he was and who he promised to be and you know a lot of people are going to what they're going to do here's my rationale to think yes we know the bible's true we know every story in the bible existed and happened the way it did um now people are going to pick and try to pick apart and split and divide they're going to go with the most um, unrealistic thing um, and say well that couldn't have happened and that you know that we may not have the evidence that balaam's donkey talked you know but the it's in the bible um there are some things that we may not have the evidence for but kind of like the trans transcendence property uh, dr marilyn correct me on this one the math uh, a plus a equals b b equals c so a equals c um where we can draw the connections and draw conclusions based on what we do have it's like a sudoku puzzle um so i like to say well go with you know what's the evidence show what do we have like christ rose from the dead is that if god is god could he raise himself from the dead okay then what's preventing him oh what if you know 500 people said they saw him after the fact oh what about this and you start building a case so that you're like well if that's possible then that means that might be possible oh and if that's possible then why not that and then why can't couldn't god flood the earth and start over humanity with four people you know so you kind of build a case that way and before you know it now you're realizing that oh if all of this could happen if all of this is true then why not everything else be true which is how we have to live anyway um god has provided himself and shown himself in so many ways then why wouldn't i trust him for whatever situation i'm about to go through because he's shown himself time and time again that's how we we live um so just to talk about this prophecy thing um just to hit it home and this is actually a good stopping point for us there was a study conducted by somebody named peter stoner and some of you may know about this um back in the 70s and he was a professor and he wrote a book called science speaks and it was about prophecy biblical prophecy and what happened is he calculated the probability of one man fulfilling all those prophecies just to validate christ um so he started with one prophecy and figured you know of all the people in that area of that time that lived at that time um it would probably be about one in ten okay so not very compelling one in ten chances of being the messiah fulfilling a prophecy so 
he then said, okay, let's work this out a little more. And he went to eight separate prophecies about Christ and said, okay, well, what are the probabilities of one man in that time period fulfilling eight of these separate prophecies? Now, mind you, these prophecies were given hundreds and hundreds of years apart. You know, they weren't one book that gave all these prophecies that were given from the beginning of time all the way through. And so he took up to eight uh, prophecies and worked out the math and the chances of eight of those prophecies being fulfilled by one person um, concluded that it would be one in 10 to the 17th power. Now that is one with 17 zeros after it. Um, and so even to go further, because we can't conceptualize that number, I don't even know the name of that number. There's too many zeros. Um, he gave a really powerful illustration. That's pretty much like somebody filling up the whole state of Texas with silver dollars, two feet deep, <laughs> and then taking one of those silver dollars, putting a mark on it, tossing it back in the pile, mixing it up thoroughly, and have a blindfolded person reach down and randomly pick up the marked coin. That was for eight prophecies. Jesus fulfilled, documented, fulfilled over 300 of them. Needless to say, that's pretty compelling evidence that Jesus is the Christ, that he says he is the sent by God. Um, and I only look for more to come out in the future month, in the future years, you know, as we're winding down the end times, you know, the story is not going to go untold. So I think, I feel like every detail is going to be unfolded and, and revealed before it's all done. Um, so this actually went really fast tonight. Um, so that's just kind of a start on the building the case for why do we trust, in, we're dwelling on the word. What is the word? Why are we dwelling on it? And what good is it to us? Um, and can we actually validate this? Well, we can. There's a lot of evidence that shows that the Bible is true, that Jesus Christ is true, and that God is true. It's all truth. And he predestined destiny. He wrote it from the beginning. And we're part of that. We're the apple of his eye. And we are in his plan. How amazing is that? <music>